Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have the uh, honour to present to you some new material, new stuff, new issues, perhaps the way forward for some of you. I'm going to be talking about drowsiness and woe beside anyone that falls asleep while I'm talking to you. <laughs> Can I just ask you to put your hands up please? Most people won't do this, but how many of you have dozed off while driving at the wheel? Okay. Nearly everyone. So have I. We didn't die, but some people do. Probably about 300 per year in Australia die on the roads. This is a serious problem. It's not only a problem for the mining industry, but that's particularly what I'm going to be talking about today. Do I have to point this particular place? Oh, here we go. Now, it's estimated, and I... Est and I hasten to emphasise the word estimated, that about 30% of road crashes are caused by drowsiness of the driver. The actual percentage may be higher than that because we don't really know exactly the state of drivers if they have a crash. It's not possible to determine exactly whether someone's alert or drowsy retrospectively, except by a whole series of uh, circumstantial evidence. But let's say 30%. Some of those produce horrific crashes. And here's an example, in, which was in 2003, 6.30 in the morning on a summer's morning, these, these two B-double trucks hit head-on. Uh, can you imagine the, the carnage? Two people died, at least a couple of million dollars worth of damage. This, this conglomeration of bits was a truck travelling in that direction. This was travelling in that direction and they hit head on here. We can only assume uh, on the basis of evidence we can put together that this driver was probably asleep. Because this fellow, if he'd been asleep, he would have driven off the road almost certainly there and hit a tree, probably would have died. But this guy coming down this way, because of the curve in the road, it's more likely that this guy caused it by being asleep and he would have driven into that head on. Uh, we don't know exactly, we never will. But fortunately these don't happen every day, but my goodness, what a terrible thing to happen, even once a year. Now let's, in the mining industry, uh, I'm quoting here a report from the Caterpillar Company in 2008, and they concluded that 93% of accidents in haulage truck scenario are due to human error. Human error covers a wide spectrum, but say two-thirds of that human error could be directly related to fatigue slash drowsiness. Herein lies a problem. Is it fatigue or is it drowsiness? And what's the difference? They haven't attempted to distinguish the two. I want to do that because it is very important. At a smaller scale, if you have two haul trucks that by sheer mismanagement of, by the drivers interact physically, they may not, the drivers won't be injured almost certainly, but the haul trucks will be out of action. Whether it's for half a day or two or three days, I don't think I have to tell you of the financial consequences of having those haul trucks out of action. Put that together with the potential for human injury and even worse for fatalities, this is a problem. Before we can really solve the problem, we need to understand it in more detail. And particularly, we need to understand about this problem of drowsiness, what it is, and what fatigue is, and how they're really different. Now, drowsiness is not something that you've probably talked about very much at all. Most of the regulations and, and uh, company and, and corporate and government directives in this field talk about fatigue. And they use the word fatigue as if it were the same as drowsiness. We've got to change that because drowsiness is far more dangerous than fatigue is. We don't really know too much about it in the public sphere, about the risks of drowsy driving, do we? But we can estimate that it's probably about as bad as speeding on the road and about drunk driving. Drowsy driving is probably the third big factor 
That's what the police say. We know a fair bit about drunk driving, don't we? We've got laws about it. And we can estimate the crash risk of different people with different blood alcohol concentrations. For example, this is a big American study, and this is the, sort of the, the, the gospel, if you like, of the risk of a driver at a particular blood alcohol concentration. And here is the blood alcohol concentration while driving. And remember, our legal limit in Australia is 0.05, so here. And the risk of crashing on an on a open road, not, not in a mine, is a relative risk here. So uh, you'll see that the risk of crashing at 0.05 is hardly greater than zero alcohol at all. There's hardly any extra risk at 0.05. But that's still a risk that we, le we legislate about. The risk is about 20% higher at 0.05 than it was at zero alcohol. That is, if you just put, let people drive on the roads and all of these people don't have any alcohol at all, and these people have 0.05, the excess risk is low. Let's say 20%. At 0.15, three times the legal limit, the risk is about eight times higher. Other things being equal, you're 800% times likely, more likely to crash than if you were completely sober. But of course, not that many drivers are at 0.15. I heard about some idiot was driving yesterday on a radio and driving at 0.227. I couldn't stand up at that level. How I could drive, I do not know. The important point is, this is not a linear relationship. It gets very steep at the top end. Similar sort of relationship with speed as well. Now, what I'm here to tell you about today is we can now measure the risk of crashing when you're drowsy as well with this same sort of relationship showing up. That's news. Now, let's just talk a, bit, a little, bit, little bit about this state of drowsiness. If we consider that we are all alert, we're, we're awake and we're alert. Earlier today, we were asleep. Tonight, we'll go to sleep. In between alert wakefulness and sleep, we always go through the state of drowsiness. Now, you may or may not feel fatigued then, but you always become drowsy before you fall asleep. So there's a continuum of states, if you like, between being very alert, which we're at now, and progressively more drowsy, if you like. If you think this is a continuum, this is very drowsy, and then there's sleep. Now, this is not a linear relationship necessarily because at the drowsy end of this scale, things change. The drowsy state is not like a little bit of wakefulness or a little bit of alertness. It's a different kind of state because it fluctuates. When we're alert, as we are now, things don't change that much from minute to minute or second to second. We're fairly static. Not completely, but fairly. In the drowsy end of this continuum, that is very much not the case. The state of drowsiness and how you can perform in that state is markedly different from second to second and minute to minute. So it's a fluctuating state. That's not true of fatigue. During the fluctuations, at the deepest levels of drowsiness, there is almost complete lack of awareness of the here and now. I know I'm standing up, talking to you, moving my hands about. You know what you're doing, you're sitting. When you're drowsy, you don't know those things. If you're driving, to be unaware of what you're doing, even for four or five seconds, can be fatal. When you're in a boardroom, you can probably get away with 30 seconds of zoozing in the corner. Not when you're driving a truck. So it's a fluctuating state and the fact that you intermittently have complete lack of awareness of the here and now, that's what makes drowsiness so dangerous. Compare that with fatigue. Now fatigue, we all know what fatigue is probably better than what we know about drowsiness. But it's a very different state. It's basically a feeling of weariness. So it's a subjective state of weariness. 
often with discomfort. You know what it's like after you've been driving all day. Well, I know what I, my shoulders ache and I feel stiff and I, I want to get out and walk about. I want to stop driving. So there's discomfort and muscle aches. There's a disinclination to keep going. You'd like to stop. And particularly to stop and rest. Rest, which means stopping, doing, stopping activity, helps fatigue. Rest makes you more drowsy. See the important distinction? Fatigue is relieved by rest. When you rest, you become more drowsy and fall asleep. Totally different states, but they've been confused. And that's because drowsiness has been neglected. Academically, in every field, drowsiness is almost ignored. <coughs> You don't have to be fatigued to become drowsy. But if you've been driving for 12 hours, you almost certainly will be fatigued. You may or may not become drowsy as well. Fatigue doesn't, doesn't fluctuate rapidly, which I've already mentioned. And what we call, what are commonly called fatigue regulations, fatigue policies, don't necessarily uh, deal with the problem of drowsiness at all. In some respects, they might. <coughs> you might have just get a glass of water. <coughs> it really have nice cough, doesn't it? But the big distinguisher, of course, is this lack of awareness. Now, how can we tackle the problem of drowsiness? Because the regulations that we've already got in place, and there are lots of them around the world, are really addressing the problem of fatigue. You see, you get fatigued the longer you're doing something. So we have regulations that won't allow you to drive for more than a certain number of hours. That's fine. But you can be drowsy after one hour driving, even though you may not be fatigued. We can educate our drivers and managers about drowsiness and sleep problems that contribute to the problem. We could potentially test for fitness of duty when people start work. <coughs> but what I'm telling you about today is a new set of possibilities where we can actually measure people's alertness and drowsiness while they drive without interfering at all with the driving task. And that's where my company, OptAlert, and the product of OptAlert comes into the fore. Now, you might say, well, why couldn't we just get people to tell us when they feel drowsy? The answer to that is they don't necessarily know when they're really drowsy. They will tell us when they're fatigued but they may not know us know that they're just about to fall asleep. There are lots of ways we can measure uh, drowsiness with brain waves and with electrodes <coughs> back on. <coughs> However, the newest technology doesn't require anything to be attached except we ask the driver to wear a pair of glasses like this. Optalert glasses. Sunglasses, but very special sunglasses. They're very special because they have sensors in them here which emit little tiny pulses of infrared light. And that light is reflected back from the eye and detected back in a detector here. And from the pattern of that reflection, which I'll show you in a minute in a video, we can tell what your eyes are doing. That tells us about alertness and drowsiness in a very unusually accurate way.